Coming up on this edition of Wolf Pack Week, electronic dance music has become extremely popular. We'll have students vote on the measure in the upcoming election. The team has been on a rampage. The pack was a perfect 8-0. Standing here inside what will soon be the new media newsroom. As I talked with our juniors or seniors who are very concerned if their thing looks a little creepy. It was so scary. I literally I Welcome to Wolfpack Week. Thanks for joining us again. I'm Madison Corney. And I'm Christy Swartz. Coming up on this edition of Wolfpack Week, ASUN has held its elections and we find out some of the results. But that election had a few glitches and we look into what happened. We'll tell you why CBS News was here on campus and we'll show you a few new apps that can make campus life a little easier. But first, we have all seen the signs around campus promoting various ASUN candidates to serve for the upcoming school year. It's not just signs and flyers that help get these candidates elected. They also have to participate in a debate. Chelsea Banks has more. The ASUN primary debates took place on campus this week with three candidates hoping to proceed to the next round. Students came out to ask questions and to support candidates Brandon Groban, Huey Weinstock, and Richard Korn. The three candidates were given two minutes to respond to the best of their ability. In case you weren't on hand to watch the debates, the editor-in-chief of the Sagebrush, Juan Lopez, live tweeted the questions and the responses. Huey Weinstock, a junior at UNR, wanted the primary debates to feature the most important part of his platform. To make sure that we are spending efficiently and making sure that we put student, uh, students' needs in perspective and making sure that we're catering to them to the best of our ability. Some students were unsure about who they were voting for. Um, they were both really good public speakers. I haven't heard much from Brandon. Um, so, I don't know, it's kind of a hard one to say. However, one particular student was confident that Richard Korn would be the best candidate. He has experience in the residence halls. He has experience, experience with Greek life and other clubs in the college of business. Reporting for Wolfpack Week, I'm Chelsea Banks. For those of you who chose to vote in the ASUN primary elections, you may have noticed something strange happening with the ballot. Kai Sisson tells us more. The ASUN presidential primary had an unusual candidate this year, the Wolfpack's very own Wolfie. His competitors? Well, Alfie, Joe Crowley, and John Mackey. For about 30 minutes, students were able to log onto their web campus and vote for not the actual candidates vying for the top position, but for two school icons and its mascots. Inkblot made an instructional YouTube video on how to vote on web campus as the ASUN moves more towards electronic voting. They posted the fictional candidates, but for only 26 minutes and three days prior to the polls opening. Specifically to make the video, the tutorial video, is why we put up the fake names. Because 30 students did vote during the glitch, is there any potential for voter fraud or miscalculation of votes? ASUN wants to set the record straight. There was no way for their vote to have gone toward um, a candidate twice because they, uh, there were no real candidates on that ballot. In light of the confusion, maybe Wolfie or Alfie would make the best candidate. I voted for Wolfie because, you know, I feel like he had I've met all my credentials. I voted for Wolfie because, you know what I'm saying, Wolfie's tight. Wolfie, definitely. Wolfie. Dude, he's a boss. Come on. Um, I vote for Wolfie, definitely. He is so cute. I would vote for John Mackey simply because, you know, the man laid the foundation for this university. Well, I'd love to go for all of them, but for now, I'll just go with Wolfie. Yay, Wolfie. Wolfie, because he's awesome and he's the best mascot. Reporting for Wolfpack Week, I'm Kai Sisson. You may have noticed a lot of cameras around campus last week. Christy tells us who was visiting and why they were here at UNR. The University of Nevada is often in the news, but it's not every day on campus that a 14-year-old achieves nuclear fusion. But that's exactly what CBS's On the Road reporter Steve Hartman came to cover. Hartman and his cameraman Les followed around Davidson Academy student Taylor Wilson for three days to get his story. After they were done shooting, they came to talk to a broadcasting class in the Reynolds School of Journalism and give tips on how to become a reporter on the national level. You know, get that lump in my throat or make me laugh. Physically, you know, how did they structure the story? How long were the shots? Hartman's report will be featured on March 30th on CBS's national 6 o'clock news. I'm Steve Hartman. And I'm Christy Swords for Wolfpack Week. Obviously, Taylor. That was so cool to meet him and get those tips, those editing tips from him. Yeah, and it's also really cool to see the perspective of someone who is on a national level as opposed to a local level. So it was a good experience. It was, definitely. 
These days, we've all, we all have cell phones, and despite the fact that we all have them, most professors get annoyed when we use them in class. But one professor is finding a way to use a cell phone app in his daily lessons. Heather Jansen has the story. Todd Feltz, a journalism professor here at UNR, has come up with a way to get students to participate more in class. In his Intro to Public Relations class, Feltz has begun to use an application called Go Soapbox that can be accessed through any smartphone, iPad, or computer. Students log in using a specific access code to enter their course and can answer different questions asked through a typed response. This new application combines students and their technology they use each day. I think it's very important to meet students with the technology that they use every day in their lives. In the classroom is no different. I shouldn't separate learning from the tools that they use. Students feel more confident sharing their ideas in class through Go Soapbox. The students who rarely speak up are more likely to do so. The only issue is the ability to get distracted by other messages on their electronics. Students like Tova Goodman feel that they learn more this new way. I learn more this way uh, because I'm a little hard of hearing, so it's hard sometimes to keep up if people are just yelling over each other. But uh, I do like the traditional communication sense where you're just talking back and forth and you're not having a lot of distractions around you. Due to the higher participation rates in class, could Go Soapbox be the future of our university classrooms? Reporting for Wolfpack Week, I'm Heather Jansen. Have you ever walked into the Knowledge Center at UNR and been completely lost? I know I have a couple times. Our Zach Anderson shows us how finding your way around the library just got a little bit easier. The Knowledge Center at UNR has recently added a new way to access virtually everything a student would need from the library without even having to set foot inside. The UNR Library app is available on both Android devices and iPhones. The app allows students to look up authors and the books that they have written, along with the availability of the books on campus. Lisa Kurt, one of the developers of the app, describes another feature that students have enjoyed. Um, the My account, um, you can actually look up your library account and renew books that way um, without coming into the library, which is fantastic. Marissa Schiffer, um, a I senior at UNR, has yet to download the app, but likes the possibility of using her phone to look up library information. Um, yeah, depending on, you know, it'd be cool because then you wouldn't have to come into the library and sit down at a computer to look at books. You could kind of do it from home, so save you time. The app has been available since the fall semester, but with little advertising, it helped give time to work out any bugs that the app might have had, and it also gave time to developers to improve the app with different features. We have new features coming, looking into um, a book look feature, which is if you were in a bookstore and you saw a book you, you wanted but maybe didn't want to buy or wanted to see if the library had, you could scan the barcode. Students will soon be able to save time another way by not having to walk to a desk to check out books. You would be able to check out the book yourself, so if you saw a book on the stacks, you can just take it, scan it in, and you're good. It's, it's attached to your account. Is this enough to download the app? I'll probably download it now, yeah. Okay. For Wolfpack Week, I'm Zach Anderson. As you may already know, ASU and elections took place this week. Chelsea is live in studio with Kai Sisson to talk about the recent election. Chelsea? Thanks, Madison. So, Kai, yeah. you did a story about the glitch. How do you think that affected the election? Yeah, you, you saw in the package that uh, the glitch only lasted about 30 minutes, but I still feel that uh, that 30 minutes, I mean, it could Ill illegitimize the entire process. And I know if I were uh, Brandon Godin, the guy who lost in the primaries, I'd be a little bit upset because, I mean, anything could have happened within that 30 minutes or the entire election as a whole. And the elections have other controversy, too. The Sagebrush just came out with an article yeah. saying how they didn't endorse any of the candidates that were coming out. Yeah. What do you think about that? Any of the presidential candidates. Yes. Uh, they just said that none of them, or neither of the two, Richard Korn or Huey Weinstock, are, are qualified. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, uh, but I do feel that ASUN definitely needs some, some more oversight uh, from the administration of the university uh, because they do control uh, over 1.7 million dollars and that number continues to grow as, as enrollment grows. I mean, that's your money, that's my money, that's Madison's money. I mean, we sh students should really care about that. What kind of oversight do you see that would make this problem better? Because I know we have a lot of problems with budgets as far as senators go and that just doubled. Well, as far as I'm concerned, no, no people our age, I mean, as young as in, in experience as we are, I mean, let's admit it, should control that much money. Uh, so I think that uh, some of the higher up, meaning the Board of Education, stuff like that, should really try and regulate that. I mean, with the senator wages, uh, the bill did get passed. We had that story in our last show. 
Uh, that bill getting passed, I mean, that's adding $25,000 to their budget, um, over $25,000. And uh, the question is, where is that money coming from? A general fund. So, I don't know. And in these tough times, I think we should really consider uh, having more insight into where our money's going. Thank you. Back to you, Christy. Thanks, Chelsea. Still ahead on Wolfpack Week, the Knowledge Center has an unusual showcase display in honor of veterans. Flipside has a huge budget, but they say they may need more money. And we find out what the sculpture in front of the Raggio Education Building is all about. We'll be right back. If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back to Wolf Pack Week. I'm Christy Swartz. Most students may not realize that they're in the company of war veterans here on the UNR campus. Veteran Services is striving to bring awareness to the campus about war and students who may be trying to cope with the after effects of having served in the military. Madison has more. More than 6,000 American lives have been lost since the start of the war in 2001. In an effort to never forget the men and women that have fought for our country, a group of professors and students at Western Nevada College put together this thought-provoking exhibition. We're hearing from veterans across the country, not only from Iraq and Afghanistan, but from Vietnam, who are saying that li reading the literary work, seeing the faces of the dead, is helping them heal. Always Lost, a Meditation on War, incorporates poems, prose, and photographs from veterans, Western Nevada college students, and the 2004 Pulitzer Prize winners David Leeson and Cheryl Diaz-Meyer. To kick off the exhibition here at UNR, an Iraq war veteran and poet, Brian Turner, visited and read his own war poetry. If a body is what you want, then here is bone and gristle and flesh. Here is the clavicle snapped wish, the aorta's open valves. UNR has seen a steady increase in the enrollment of student veterans who have recently served in Iraq or Afghanistan. Veteran Services is striving to help these students feel more comfortable on campus. The poetry reading and war exhibition were a part of that effort. The exhibit attracted so much attention that it is now traveling across the United States to be displayed on other college campuses, and a replica will travel to Washington, D.C. in the spring. The veterans will be able to go to our nation's capital and know that they are not forgotten, at least by one small college in Nevada. Always Lost will be on display in the UNR Knowledge Center until May 4th. Reporting for Wolfpack Week, I'm Madison Corney. So that exhibit is just, it touches your heart and I just, everyone needs to go see it. It's, it's going to be in Washington, D.C. and it's just, it's so, everyone has to see it. It's amazing because you don't realize how many people lost their lives in the war until you see every single picture like and the, that. And the pictures are tiny and yeah. then you see this huge wall of yeah. them. It's just it's devastating. Amazing. Flipside Productions and ASU in Activity receives almost $200,000 a year from the student government budget for putting on events like this one in front of the Joe. That money represents about 20% of the entire ASUN budget. And while some events attract a large number of students, many others are sparsely attended. Some students think Flipside is, has to do a better job of promoting their events. Uh, I think it mostly would have to do with the marketing and how much they're able to actually put themselves out there. They're not, I've never actually seen them table or do anything like that. I've seen signs, I've never actually seen people out uh, doing marketing like other clubs on campus do. One issue ASUN is considering is whether increasing the budget may lead to bigger events and better attendance. But they say the focus of every event is always on the serving, the students, and the community. Always have a reason for every event that we do. If it's either reaching out to the public in some way or just finding something for students to do. Um, but I do think we uh, sometimes need more money so we can put on these larger events and keep on doing them so that the students can enjoy them. You may have noticed this new sculpture on campus back in January when the semester started. And you may have wondered what it is and where it came from. The sculpture depicting several young children playing on a rock was donated to the university by Nina Miller, wife of Ed Miller, who was president of UNR from 1965 until 1973. The sculpture takes up a space on campus that used to be empty. 
really like the statue. I think it's a nice addition. And the, the space before uh, was not used at all. It was just kind of empty space. There was bike racks. And now it really gives the students and anyone on campus a place to go sit, to study, to read. And uh, I think it's a nice uh, focal point uh, for the college. While many students don't know where the sculpture came from, they think it's an appropriate addition to Raja. Just to have a statue with kids and everything in front of the building, I thought it was really cool. The week of March 26th is Journalism Week here at UNR. The special week-long celebration of the news media features special programs and speakers from across the country. Chelsea is in studio to tell us more. Thanks, Christy. So, Marissa, you're a graduate student here at UNR who's helping plan J Week. How has that been so far? It's been a really wonderful experience. We're going to have a lot of great people coming in, and it's been really great. Who do you have coming in that you think probably is the most interesting? Um, Sarah Gainham is a reporter who works for the Patriot News, which is actually the paper that first broke the story of the Jerry Sandusky child abuse sex scandal. Um, she's only 24 years old, so she's an age you know, of a lot of the students that go to UNR. So she's a great person to have come in. She can tell us all about her experiences as a journalist, as a young journalist. So how long is the week? I know usually they say it's a week, but it only lasts a couple of days. Um, it actually starts on Tuesday, which is the 26th of March, and it's going to go through that Friday. So it's about four days of events. And would you recommend just journalism students going or any students, really? The events are open to the public. They're open to anyone and everyone who wants to attend. So if you have any interest in any of these, you know, sort of hot topics that are going on right now, I highly recommend you go. I know it's tradition for our journalism school to do J Week, but is there anything different that we're doing this year? Um, well, this year we have the traditional Scripps Dinner, which takes place on Wednesday nights, which honors um, students that excel in the journalism field. And then in addition to that, we're also going to have a bunch of people Skyping in. So Sarah Gainham, for example, was going to be doing a virtual conference with the students, which is new and embraces all the new technology and the new journalism school. And then we also are going to be having different meetups all around the city with these people that are coming in. So some of the stuff is going to be taking place off campus, which is a nice thing, too. Perfect. Thanks. Back to you, Madison. Thanks, Chelsea. Still ahead on Wolfpack Week, we'll check in with Mike Stephenson to see how PAC basketball did at the WAC tournament this past weekend, and we'll have all the latest in Nevada sports. And it's the newest trend around campus, humans versus zombies. Reporter Travis Walgren will show us what this new club is all about. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Wolfpack Week. I'm Christy Swartz. Nevada's basketball teams have had a huge week. Here with that and other sports is Mike Stephenson. Mike? The Nevada men's basketball team wrapped up regular season play with a 25-5 record, their best since the 06-07 campaign. But in order to secure their spot in the NCAA tournament, they had to take care of business at the WAC tourney. First up, San Jose State. Lots of Pack fans made the trip to Vegas. This was an ugly one to start, with the Pack and Spartans combining for an abysmal 27 points in the entire first half. The Pack picked it up in the second half, though, led by WAC Player of the Year Deontay Burton's 16 points. Nevada was able to avoid the first round upset, pulling away for a 10 point victory. The Pack then faced La Tech, just six days after playing them in Reno on senior night. The Bulldogs came out scorching, hitting their first seven three pointers en route to a 15 point lead. But the Pack weren't going down without a fight cutting the lead to three at half. The second half was a wild one, with the Pack and Bulldogs going back and forth. Nevada recaptured the lead with just under three minutes to go, but it didn't last long as the Bulldogs came back and were able to ice the game with late free throws, stunning the Pack in the second round. La Tech's hot shooting was the topic after the game. Yeah, give La Tech a lot of credit. Uh, they came out and played uh, very well. Uh, we didn't have an answer for them on the first half. I thought we fought well. Uh, Get back in the game, took a lead on a couple of occasions, uh, but never could get a stop when we needed it. They played really well. They were ready for 40 minutes, and, uh, you know, they shot the ball exceptionally well. And uh, it's really tough to play against a team like that. That gets so hot. I don't want to hang my head over this. I know we still got postseason and anything's possible, so I just keep my fingers crossed, and we'll see what happens. 
Well, the Pack's postseason fate has been determined. They're playing at Oral Roberts in the first round of the National Invitational Tournament, which means they didn't receive an at-large bid for the big dance. We've got sports reporter Dallas Kalodny in studio to discuss the Pack's postseason. So, Dallas, the NCAA Selection Committee came out and said that out of the 68 teams that made the dance, Nevada was number 71. Now, do you think that's a fair placement, or were they snubbed? You know, I don't, first I'll start saying you know, this was a very good pack team, and they probably deserve to be in the tournament, but so did the half a dozen other teams who had just as good a resumes. And to say they were snubbed in a 68-team tournament where every single team has the chance to get in that tournament on their own billing by winning their own conference tournament, I can't necessarily say they were snubbed, but they are definitely a good team. I agree. You look at the early BYU loss early in the year. They lost at Iona in a bracket buster game. You win those two games, they're probably in there. Oh, exactly. So with that said, they're in the NIT now. After the great year that they did have, do you think that this is a failure to be in the NIT? Oh, absolutely not. They were 13 and 19 last year, so making any postseason tournament is a success. So I think also the NIT tournament, they're going to get some more practice and be prepared for next year, and hopefully they will make the NCAA tournament. I agree. I mean, I know they wanted the NCAA, but at the end of the day, you control your own destiny and you got to deal with the cards you dealt. Oh, exactly. Thanks, Dallas. The Nevada women had a less than ideal season, finishing 7 and 22. But late wins against New Mexico State and La Tech bumped them up to the seventh seed heading into the WAC tournament. The pack faced two seeded Utah State in the first round. Led by senior guard Kate Kevorkin, who finished with 21 points, Nevada went into the half up four. But it didn't last too long as the Aggies went on a strong comeback, outscoring the pack by 13 in the second half to claim the nine point victory. Kayla Williams scored 10 points in her final game for the pack one that was very emotional for the senior leaders. No, this year wasn't the year we expected, but you know, I don't regret anything, and towards the end, we finally started to get it together, and just things happen, uh, but it's been, it was a good four years at Nevada. This game means everything to me, and it's really hard right now because, um, I would do anything to do it all over again. It's really hard to go out like this, but um, I'm just really proud of our coaches and our teammates for sticking together and getting through this season. Former PAC basketball standout Luke Babbitt had a notable accomplishment in a recent game against the Boston Celtics. Babbitt scored a season-high 10 points in Boston, including going 2-for-2 two two from three-point land. Only problem is it was during garbage time as Luke's trailblazers were down by about 30 points. Babbitt has struggled to crack the rotation for the Blazers in his second season after leaving Nevada following his sophomore year. That's it for sports. Back to you, Madison. Thanks, Mike. You may have seen a bunch of students running around campus. They carry Nerf guns and they wear different colored bandanas. So what exactly are they doing? Travis Walgren has the story. You've probably seen them lurking in the shadows around campus at night. Students wearing bandanas and wielding Nerf guns constantly looking over their shoulders. They're playing a new game called Humans vs. Zombies. But what exactly is this game? So Humans vs. Zombies is pretty much an extreme version of tag. Um, you're a human or you're a zombie. The objective of the human is to survive and not get tagged by a zombie. The objective of the zombie is to tag as many humans as possible. So the game ends is when the humans survive at the final day or when the zombies infect everyone. Humans get to have Nerf guns, and zombies just have themselves. This rapidly growing week-long game culminated last Friday night outside the Joe, where the death toll continued to rise. I caught up with the head moderator of the game, Catherine Mundy, who talked about how this club formed from a previous similar club last semester. Some of the guys who had been in our last um, uh, mission I'll talk together about this is a really great idea, we'd like to continue this club, and that's how the admins kind of began. It's because we were some of the final survivors of the club, and we were talking on the Facebook group, and then we all pulled together. So it was kind of a group idea, and then we started putting it into life. The first game of this semester was a rousing success with over 200 participants. More games will be scheduled soon, and they could include some new aspects. We have a few missions that we went up try out that's called our food missions where you can find your objective and that would be like a cake or a pizza and if you find it you can keep it and eat it. We'll have tons of these around the campus. As you can see behind me this game is pure chaos and if you want to get involved it's not too late. Just go to the UNR Humans vs. Zombies page and see if you have what it takes to survive. Reporting for Wolfpack Week, I'm Travis Walgren. I'm ready. Let's go. I'm ready. I have my outfit picked out. <laughs> 
Do you want to become a ninja as, zombie killer with as me? As long as they're not painted like zombies, I think I can handle it. But that looks a little, that's a little intense for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this edition of Wolfpack Week. If you have any suggestions for future stories for us, just go ahead and email us at wolfpackweek at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.